that um, that person may be in shape, but I'm in shape too. Brown's a shape. There are all different kinds of bodies. And going through high school and everything else, we all know, obviously, there's all different kinds of shapes, models, sizes, etc., etc., etc. But the body, when we get down to it, is what we refer to as the physical structure of someone. You know, I say this is my body, and you're automatically going to think, well, that's the physical structure. We get down to the bones, the flesh, the structure, the makeup, not the physical makeup, but the composition. Mary went to dictionary to find the human body in this way, or a body. The main part of a plant or an animal, especially as distinguished from limbs and head, trunk, held her arms, well, it just goes down through there, but let's go down. The main central part or principal part, such as the name of the church, a bed or box of a vehicle, the enclosed part or partly enclosed part of an automobile. So we're getting down to the sections part, but it's still part of that main body. And then we get down to the second definition. The organized physical substance of an animal or plant, either living or dead. Referring to either the muscular part, the body part, the normal body, temperature, or the material part or nature of a human being when the soul leaves the body, which is, we're referring to once again, the structure, the flesh, the bone, the muscle. So we're going to be talking about bodies today and probably next week as well. And we're going to start with one of the most complicated bodies at all, because we're going to start at the top. Would someone please read 1 John chapter 5, verse 7. 1 John 5, verse 7. And if someone else wants to find Revelation 5, verses 1 and 5. So Revelation 5, 1 and 5, we're going to begin with 1 John 5, verse 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. This is the easiest verse to prove Trinitarianism ever. It is laid right out there. There is no arguing it. There is no debating it. There are three that bear witness in heaven. And these three are one. What about Revelation chapter 5, verses 1 and 5? What about verse 5? And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not the cold, for the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed, and he will open his book, and he who sits in the world. Like I said, we are about to discuss one of the most difficult bodies, and I am not going to be able to explain everything. I am not going to be able to distinguish all the details, but we're going to be looking at just the physical makeup of God, not his attributes. With the physical body of God. So we've seen here that there are three that bear witness in heaven. We know that there's, there's the Father, there's the Son, there's the Holy Ghost. Three different persons, but only one God. I brought out Revelation chapter here, um, chapter five here, because as we start talking, and well, our next point will probably be that God is spirit. But the big question comes down to is. We know there's three in heaven, but the big question is always, well, when you get to heaven, what do you expect to see? What do you really expect God to look like? Because we know in heaven there's going to be, we know that there's the Father seated on the throne. We know that the Son has seated, sit down at the right hand of the Father. Um, if we go back, I didn't pull it out here, but uh, for a lack of time, but I think Earlier in the book of Revelation, it talks about the Holy Ghost being before the throne in the form of uh, eyes seen through in and out. What do we really expect to see when we get to heaven? I often, because when we talk about Isaiah and the vision that he has of the throne, which now I'm leaving my notes just as a side note, but now, well, that's when I get myself in trouble. Uh, but in the book of Isaiah, chapter one, one and two, not Isaiah, Ezekiel, Ezekiel 1 and 2. We have the glory of God being presented. We have the throne, the rainbow about the throne, and the likeness of a man in the throne. Well, the likeness of a man is Jesus Christ. 
I mean, we can trace that throughout Scripture uh, in the image of Jesus Christ. But he, Ezekiel only saw one throne, so how many thrones are there really? Is there one from the Father? Is there one from the Son? If there's only one, is there just Jesus seated there? And is the Father's Spirit? Is he not visible? But yet, here in Revelation chapter 5, we have the Father seated on the throne, ending a book, and Jesus Christ somewhere else. So, just things to think about. I'm not trying to confuse you. But when it comes to the composition of God's Bible, we really don't know everything. But we do know some things. We can know that, Jesus, that when it comes to the Father and the Holy Ghost, that they're a spirit. At one time, Jesus was spirit as well, but when we start talking Jesus, we have a few other steps involved in there that we have to talk about. But God is spirit. John chapter 4 and verse 24, the Bible states, um, Jesus is speaking to the woman at the well. And when you look at her, just to set the, top, the setting, they're at the base of a mountain. The temple is seated at the top of the mountain. So this well is literally at the base of the mountain, probably by the steps going up to the temple. So Jesus is talking to her about spiritual things at the base of the temple. And he's asking her about her life, and she, he's referring back to her. And she responds, and he comes back to verse 24. Let me just come back to verse, uh, we'll start at 21. We'll go down to 24. And Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is when the true worshippers shall worship the Father. In spirit, in truth, for the Father seeketh to worship him. And then we get to verse 24. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So when it comes to the physical makeup of God, God has a spiritual body. And I'm using God as overall. And the reason I say that is when we look at, when people say God, they think, oh, just God. But, and they automatically go to the Father. But realistically, is the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Ghost is God. So we can say God and still be referred to one of them or all three collectively. So here she, she is told that God is a spirit. If we get down to it as spiritual bodies, I don't know how far I have this broken down because I just broke this down this morning, but realistically, the Father has a spiritual body. Jesus Christ once at one time had a spiritual body. And the reason I say that is that we get in the progression. He was made flesh, and we'll talk about that. And then now he has a glorified body. But at one time, he did have a spiritual body. And then the Holy Ghost, of course, possesses a spiritual body. Now, when it comes to their bodies, when it comes to the spiritual, they're not always visible to us. God is invisible for the most part. If someone would please read 1 Timothy 1.17. 1 Timothy 1.17. Now unto the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Immortal, what was the next word? Invisible. The definition that the Holy Ghost gave me years and years ago when I was teaching about spiritual warfare is so many times when listening to teachers and uh, preachers more so preach, it's almost as if they always separate our world from God, the spiritual world. Like there was always a gap. And of course, in my mind's eye, I, I, I like to question, I like to think, oh, then if they're separate, then where's this door that everybody's going through? And what are the window? But the explanation the Holy Ghost gave me years and years ago and it just stuck with me because it, it just got so ingrained in my spirit at the time. I mean, if you ever felt something jump into your spirit and just was like, there it is and you're not getting rid of it. It's just, it's not needed. It is the spirit world is nothing but the invisible part of God's creation. Because demons are always around us. Angels are always around us. Uh, the Holy Ghost is always around us. If it would be a separate world, then Where's the window they go through? Where's the door? Because there has to be that dividing point. But realistically, there is no dividing point. God's creation is God's creation. Whether his creation is heaven, because the Bible states that God has to humble himself to dwell in humble. 
that thing that he created. But yet there's no distinction between that creation and our creation, that they're separate worlds, but rather they're one and the same. People will say, I've heard it said for years and years and years, and I'm sure Brother Russ has heard this here. If you go out to the farthest part of space, it's going to be utter darkness. I don't believe that. I believe that if you go to the utter parts of space, you're going to find nothing but light. I think that's where you're going to find the gospel. Because it talks, and we whole different story. Demons, principalities, their powers, their thrones and dominions being in the atmosphere and outer space. But regardless, there's no separation between God's creation. So just because we don't see God doesn't mean he's not here. The Holy Ghost is in our midst right now. We may not see him. We can feel him. If uh, the Holy Ghost really started moving and feeling that we had a full Pentecostal blowout service, we could see the results. Like the wind blows, you don't see the wind, but you see the leaves wind moving, you see the trees moving, you know it's there. You know air is all around us, you're breathing. If you stop breathing, you know obviously there's no air. But God is spirit, and he is invisible. So, now let's talk about Jesus. When we look at Jesus, back at the beginning of creation, he was spirit. His body was spirit. If we're talking about his physical makeup, he was spirit. We find this in Joshua chapter 5, verses 13 through 15, which I'll go ahead and read. Joshua 5, 13 through 15. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him, with a sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went out unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? And he said, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord, I am now come. And Joshua fell on his face in the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith the Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy, and Joshua do so. Now, first of all, we're going to debunk that this is not just an angel. This is Jesus Christ. Throughout the Old Testament, we'll see several times where he's referred to as the angel of the Lord. But here in this passage, I think it was verse 13 we read, Joshua got down and he did what? He worshipped him. Any time an angel was worshipped, they stopped him immediately. Book of Revelation, John gets down, the angel rebukes him and said, I am my fellow laborer, don't you worship me? But this angel accepts the worship. And not only that, he instructs Joshua to take off his shoes. Why? It's holy ground. Moses in front of the bush. What does he do? Take off his shoes because he's on holy ground. And we could go out throughout the Old Testament time and time again, proving that Jesus had a spiritual body, that he appeared as an angel. We can talk about Abraham when the three angels came. Uh, to his tent there before the two other angels went to Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, we can talk about um, Hagar and Ishmael after Abraham kicks her out and the angel appears unto her and tells her his name that he's I am or I am. We can go on and on and on, but we see at first that Jesus had a spiritual body. And once again, the spiritual manifestation of this body, I don't know what God's body looks like. I really don't. To come down to the word of God and try to dig, to dig all we want, but the truth of the matter is, when he gets to heaven, what will the Holy Ghost appear to us as? What will it look like? The Father, I don't know all that. But I do know that while God is spirit and he is invisible, there are times that he's made that spiritual body visible. We've seen that in the book of Revelation, that right, where they clearly saw the Father seated on the throne, handing out the book to the Son. We can talk about Genesis where God came down and he walked in the garden with Adam and Eve. What of that was, and then the more I studied, the more I questioned, was that really the Father, or is that why I really believe that it'd be a Christophany, you know, Jesus coming down to walk with us? I don't know, but what we do know is that the spiritual body is invisible, but yet at the same time, if God wants to, he can manifest and make it seen to the human eye. Jesus Christ was a spirit, he appeared as an angel. We know that angels are uh, that we entertain and you know sometimes unaware. 
you know, that angels that camp around those that fear God. We don't always see angels. Sometimes God does let us see angels. So there's that point where we go from not seeing the spiritual, where our spiritual eyes are open, uh, and we can see the spiritual world. There are people that have seen demons, and, there, and demons have a spiritual body, because we have to remember, demons are nothing but fallen angels. So Christ at one time has a spiritual body. And then it, what does John 1 and verse 14 instruct us about the body of Christ? John 1, 1, 14. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only God. So, the word Jesus Christ was what? It made flesh. So, there was a point where he went from that spiritual body to the Holy Ghost, impregnating uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus. And at that point, the word becomes flesh. So, Jesus Christ goes from having a spiritual body to having a physical body. And we know he had a physical body because he died. And a, a spirit can't die. But you and I can die because of the curse that was placed on us by Adam, which we'll talk about next week. But then he goes from there, and I'm not going to go over this because I'm, we're going to cover it in more detail, but Jesus Christ dies, and then what happens? Three days later, he rises to death again. When he rises from the dead, does he still have that fleshly body like we think of? Glorified body. Exactly. He now has a glorified body. A glorified body is different from what we have now. And we'll talk about that again next week, but just so we get down to it. In the beginning, our bodies were meant to regenerate themselves and live on forever. When Adam sinned, Sin brought death and disease, and because of that, now we die. We experience sickness, we experience disease, we experience COVID, whether natural or at first, and man, it doesn't matter. Because Adam sinned, now we experience all these things. But when we get to the glorified body, it's a reversal. It is now going to live on forever. So when we look at Jesus Christ, he started off as spirit, moved on to flesh, as we think of it, flesh, bone, and blood. And then when he rose from the dead, the Holy Ghost gave him a new body, a glorified body. Before I move on, does anybody want to ask any questions? Anybody want to ask, throw anything to that? What do you think when you say uh, the Bible says that uh, Jesus is on the right hand of God? Is there a hierarchy in the I wouldn't say that there's a hierarchy. I would say we place the hierarchy there because all three are equal. Um, to say that there's a hierarchy would be that there's lesser gods, but they're not lesser gods. They're all one god. Now, we always refer to it as the Father being uh, the head or the first person, Jesus Christ being the second uh, figure of the Godhead, and the Holy Ghost being the third. I would say they're all I'm just going by ancient yeah. history with kings and stuff. It can't yeah. always be the center of what they say. Yeah. So okay. about the side. No, I don't think it has anything to do with that. I just think it has more to do with all three are equal in power. Um, everything. They're equal across the board because all three are one. And then in the beginning led up. Yeah. They, they, all, they all converge. It's just they have different functions. Just, I, I, I have another no, you're good. Father. Um, we spoke of the fallen angels. Mm -hmm. And I was taught early in my Christian life that angels were created beings that had no free will. And yeah. that's where we were different from the angels because we had free will to fall. And we're different from the angels because we were created in the image of God. That's why we're different. They had free will too. Oh, they, had free will. they still have free will. So, what you're saying is the 
angels will just back out and fall all the time. I don't think they will. We've already got that point. Um, the thing is, even when it comes to, and I'm not saying it started there, but even when we talk about the tribulation period and after that, um, the devil's going to be loose, uh, bound for a thousand years, then he's going to be loose. Why is he going to be loose again after a thousand years? Because the devil goes forth to tempt us. He's the one that goes forth to see who's going to truly serve God and not, not that he was created for that purpose because he wasn't. But everyone has to be treated fair. The angels have already had that temptation. They've already made up their mind. They're going to follow Christ. They're going to follow God. They're going to serve God. And that's already been established. And realistically, how much of a difference does it make when you see things? Like, somebody can, if your dad tells you that if you get into that cookie jar, I'm going to whoop your behind, those are just words until it actually happens. And then Brother Ken gets in that cookie jar and you find that he can't sit for a week. It's like, well, you know what? I am not getting into that cookie jar. You have free will. You have the possibility to make up your mind, but because you've already seen what happened, you've already seen the consequences, I ain't going to do that. Realistically, the angels, there's really nothing that's hid from them as far as physically seeing. I mean, they don't understand some things. No, they don't understand. But physically seeing, they don't see. There's, I would say there's nothing that's hid from them. They roam to and fro. I mean, think about um, They work for God. They surround us. They see the demons that are around us. They see the personalities. Even though we can't see thrones of power to now they can see them. They go by them. They see the angels that have fallen, that are in judgment. They can see down in the pit and see that they're in chains, they're being tormented. At this point, that's not hit from them. Why would they want to say, well, you know what? If I do that, I'm going to end up with them. I'm going to give it a go. <laughs> it, it, it's already been proven. They've already been tested. I don't see that happening. Really. They have free will, but the decision's already been made that they're going to have to serve God or not. Right, and the amount of time, if you look at time as a linear event, God was talking to outside of time, and I'm sure the angels were outside of time, oh, too. Yeah. And they probably see uh, pretty much uh, the story unfold. Oh, absolutely. And for us, we always probably, I would say, view it through our mortality to some degree and face it. Angels' bodies. There's no death there. It's just kind of, if it, if anything, constant regeneration, if they have cells and all that stuff, like us, did, like we did in the beginning. But they looked out, and they have never experienced uh, pain, torment, disease, sickness. That's something that man has experienced because of our sin. Well, we've lost that. They didn't. So for them to know that, well, there's no end to my life. I'm just going on and on and on to look at it to see their fellow brothers in arms that they used to serve beside or make serve God beside. Now they're stuck down there. And there's no end to their torment or their punishment. And they know that it's only going to maybe, if not said same, get worse. They realize that, yes, those that are kept in chains, they are going to be free for a little bit. It's going to be no period of time. It's going to be over like that. When you think about angels, they've been here. From before the beginning, Jesus Christ establishes the beginning as when he made them male and female. Angels were there and rejoicing at the foundations of the world. When God just piled the building blocks, the angels were there. They got to see everything and to think, well, yes, they're going to be loose for maybe at the most seven years. They've been washing down on God's creation for at least 6,000 years. Well, I personally, I think was referring to the creation of the entire universe. I think they were kind of oh, I watching, watching the whole shebang being created. But it was a big bang caused by that. They were watching it. Oh, absolutely. I know what the order happened where they created the angels before they created the people. I'm sure that the individual planet. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and they just watched it all unfold because we know in Genesis chapter one that God really didn't create anything besides the angels that we're aware of until Genesis one one, and we know according to Job that the angels were there 
and God formed everything. And even the sun and the planets and the stars, I, I should say planets, planets aren't mentioned, but the sun and the stars are mentioned specifically. And God didn't form them until what, like day three or something? So they just got to watch everything unfold. They have their minds made up. They know where they're not going to fall. I'm committed to that. They've seen everything unravel. They've seen God carrying out judgment. They see, at this point, the devil's already been sentenced. The angels have already been sentenced. And they've witnessed all that. It's just a matter of waiting to see the sentence uh, unfold, but they've seen the judgment pass over. So, any other thoughts or questions at this point? But it was interesting. I just thought with everything going on that Easter coming up, we're going to be familiar with the glorified body, but I've never really heard anybody go through talk about the different bodies and how they correlate. It's important for us to know because it gives us an idea of who God is. It gives us a better sense of God's creation. It gives us a better idea of who our enemy is. Because we're going to wrap it up here, but next week when we come back, we're going to talk about angelic beings, bodies, and maybe we'll get to the human body, depending. We'll see. We're not going to rush it, but this is the God that we're saying. This is his creation. He's done, when you look at the human body, even just the makeup of it, not, it's spectacular. It really is. Um, when you talk about even DNA and uh, messenger DNA and all that, it's like a machine within a machine within a machine. It's just, who would have thought of this? When you, if you ever listen to Lee Strobel's document, uh, document, documentary on the case for a creator. He talks about just cells and how they have um, the flagellum and just how it's like God created a little motor for that one little cell to have its tail spin to go throughout the box. And that's how it's described. So we get, there's how many millions of cells in each one of our bodies. God's creation, to quote God, was very perfect. It's sin that destroys. It is sin that ruins. It is sin that brings decay. But I hope this is interesting. Like I said, we'll just go through and next week we'll talk about angelic bodies and we'll talk about the bodies of demons a little bit, what their composition is, and what they look like a little bit. So at this point, why don't we all stand? Don't forget. Just by way of announcement, don't forget this coming Friday at 6.30 game night, this coming Sunday morning service. Oh, we won't be covering this next week. We're going to have a business meeting next week for the Sunday morning service. And just keep our Easter egg hunt in prayer. And also, anyone who's willing to help out that day would be greatly appreciated. We're planning on the last Saturday of this month, which is the 27th at 10.30. And if it rains, then we'll, let, we'll fall on the Saturday before Easter once again at 30, which is the following day. So let us bow our heads in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and will do. Lord, we thank you that your God who reigns on high with us now, Lord. Now, Lord, I pray that you just keep us safe as we go our way, bring us back safely tonight, prayer meeting on Sunday. Lord, should you tarry, Lord? And may your peace, which passes all understanding, just constantly reside with us. And may we have a greater desire and hunger to chase after you, to grow closer to you than ever before. We pray, Lord, that you just move in ways that we could never dream or imagine. And just move in this church, Lord, give us soul. We thank you for everything that you've done for us. We thank you for continuing to meet our needs. And we ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Everybody said, Amen. Amen. Oh. Also, Broadway Assembly is having a prayer, a prayer meeting, a revival services. If anybody wants to go, I know Sister Beth and myself are leading to head up there. So everybody's welcome to go. We have two extra seats. You are.